Oh, that's a shame. We didn't get the whole introduction. All right. Um, here, I think. I don't know if you have the raise. It should be. Yeah, we found it. I got it. So found okay. it. Yeah. yeah Are you able good. to do it if I'm sharing the screen? Raise hands. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So I'm going to share the screen. Back again. And it's, it's recording. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. All right, so I'm sorry, we started the recording a little late. So, you know, we open with And what I'm saying is that this introduction is more than history. It's not just going through the transmission of Torah Shabbat Peh. What it's doing is also presenting halacha, but it's presenting a very fundamental aspect of halacha, perhaps one of the most fundamental, and that is specifically the halachot of Torah Shabbat Peh, not of how to learn Torah Shabbat Peh, of what Torah Shabbat Peh is. And that is extremely important. And I will say to you all now that I find in my rabbinic career in the last 25 years, that one of the single most misunderstood things among laymen, right, which causes them not only confusion in terms of halakha and what it is they, they, they should do, but it ends up becoming a confusion in terms of the entirety of Orthodox Judaism. Because Orthodox Judaism, I always say the elephant in the room of Orthodox Judaism are the mitzvot. It's well, no problem. You know, people have no issues talking about the philosophy. They have no problem talking about the concepts and ideas. Anybody can sit in a parasha class. The elephant in the room in, orthodox, in, in orthodoxy are the mitzvot. It's the fact that we have a brit, we have a covenant, and we have commandments that are part of that covenant. And that is essentially what we're going to see Harambam is dealing with over here. And so part of that is what we call the Torah Shabbat Peh. And people have such confusion over the Torah Shabbat Peh. What is it? What is it meant to be for us? What constitutes the Torah Shabbat Peh? Why, if the Torah is supposed to be Baal Peh, it's supposed to be oral, has it been written down? How do you establish Torah Shabbat Peh? Is Torah Shabbat Peh movable, changeable? Does it evolve? Doesn't it evolve? How is it? Who, who has the authority? I mean, it, it's the foggiest of things for people. I don't know if I'm the only one that feels this way and, and thinks this way, but I'm telling you that I feel and think this way over 20 years of dealing with students and people that constantly come up and ask me questions and where I realize that the source of the problem of their questions is this. So what Harambam is, is what we're really, what we're learning over here in this, in this Hakdama is, is golden. It is absolutely essential. It is at the bedrock foundation of our Torah and Mizvot. And what Harambam is doing in this Hakdama is teaching us the halachot of Torah Shabbat Peh. What is Torah Shabbat Peh? And one of the things that we will find that Harambam uh, will point out for us is that Torah Shabbat Peh is very, very specific. Very specific. And it has a beginning and it has an end. And that's something that already people are confused about. What do you mean Torah Shabbat has a beginning and end? Torah Shabbat, the written Torah, we know has a beginning and an end. It opens with Bereshit bara Elohim et HaShemayim et HaAretz, and it ends with Le'ayne Kol Yisrael. That's the Torah Shabbat. Of course, there are the Nevim and the Ketuvim, but essentially the Torah that has its mitzvot, the mitzvot, all mitzvot are in the five books of the Torah, Moshe Rabbein. The Torah Moshe Abdi. The point that Harambam is going to make, and that I will show you that he makes, is that the Torah Shabbat Peh is also finite. It has a beginning and it has an end. So now you might be thinking, right? You should at least be thinking. Well, what does that mean? I mean, we know that it says the Torah is rahava me'eretz midah, right? That it's, 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 it's never ending, the Torah. You, you know, you can talk and talk and talk and talk. You can open up situation after situation after situation. You can have massive uh, libraries that never end. Isn't it true that the Torah is never ending? That it is a conversation that goes on for all generations? That everyone, there's always this concept of chidush in Torah, of, of innovation and nuance in Torah that we're able to bring out? Yes, there is, but that's not called Torah Shabbat Peh. That's called something else. And what Harambam is talking about over here, specifically, is Torah Shabbat Peh. So in order to be able to understand this, I'm going to show you something else first, before we actually get into the nitty gritty of this particular Akdama. And that's this halacha, for example, in Hilchot Talmud Torah, in the first chapter of Hilchot Talmud Torah. Harambam here says, we're going to jump into this just to be able to see what it is that I'm telling you. Harambam here says, 
חייב לשלש את זמן למידתו. A person has to split the time that he studies his Torah into three sections, to study three different aspects of the Torah. Shlish b'Torah shebichdav. A third of a person's time has to be spent studying the written Torah. Shlish Torah shebal peh. A third of it needs to be the Torah shebal peh. Shlish and another third should be in this thing he calls yavin v'yaskil ahari davar mereshito trying to delve in and understand an end of something from its beginning, which means that I start to look at the openings of things, what we call uh, in other terms, Rashi Prakim, that from the Rashi Prakim, I'm able to delve in to understand the, the other details that are implied in it or intimated in it. You'll see Davar Mi Davar, I look at one thing and able to pull out other things from a particular subject that I'm learning that are not necessarily explicitly mentioned in that subject. Yidameh Davar Davar, I compare and contrast ideas. Yavin Bamidot Shatora Nedreshet Bahem, I go through all of the principles that we have to use in order to be able to derive all of these things that I'm mentioning from the Torah. Until I know how to be able to pull the laws, you know, of Asur and Mutar and so on and so forth out of the Torah. But this, this system, this system of derivation is essentially what he's talking about. What do we call that? We don't call that Torah Shebechtav and we don't call that Torah Shebaal Peh. What we call that is Gemara. Zehu Hanikra Gemara. So there's three things. There's Torah Shebechtav, there's Torah Shebaal Peh, and there's Gemara. Torah Shebechtav and Torah Shebaal Peh are finite. They have very clear beginnings and endings. And one can, as one is required to do, study Kol HaTorah Kula, the entire Torah, which is comprised of Torah Shebechtav and Torah Shebaal Peh. That does not include Gemara. And when the hachamim say that it is rehava minya or rehava me'eres mida, that it's greater than the sea and larger than the earth and so on and so forth, they're talking about Gemara, not Torah Shebaal Peh and not Torah Shebechtav. And what Haramban does over here in this book and what he's going to say that he's going to do in this introduction is all you need in order to study the entirety of the Torah Shebaal Peh is to read my book. Now, that's a pretty powerful thing to say. But that's what the Rambam says with full confidence. So people think, like, what does that mean? How does it? Because people get confused with that because they don't know the difference between Torah, Shebaal Peh, and Gemara. A Rambam never says, you can learn the entire Gemara from reading my book. There's no such thing as the entire Gemara because it's bigger than anything. What he says is, you can learn the entire Torah Shabbat Peh from my book. And so that is a very important thing. And that's why to him, everything, kol mitzvotecha, right? The whole of your mitzvot, which is talking about the, the commandments themselves and the laws involved in those commandments in terms of our action to be able to carry out those commandments is comprised of Torah Shebaal Tveh and Torah Shebechtav, and I put the entire thing in my book. And all you need to do is read the Torah Shebechtav, Ubazeh, he says, which we'll read towards the end of that demo. That does not mean at all that Harambam does not expect people to learn Gemara. He just says, don't worry about needing to find the Torah Shabal Peh in the Gemara. That I've taken care of for you. But you should always learn Gemara. Why not? You need to learn Gemara. As a matter of fact, the majority of a person's learning should end up being Gemara, being Gemara Rambam writes. Okay? So this is extremely important to be able to have an awareness of before we even begin with Harambam and what he's writing over here, but we will see that inside. So Harambam says, Notice he starts with the mitzvot here. Again, this is about the mitzvot. It's about the commandments, the details of the commandments, carrying out the commandments. That's this book. And he says all of the mitzvot, all of the commandments that were given to Moshe at Sinai, they were given with their interpretations. Shene'emar, as it says, Ve'etena lecha et luchot ha'even, ve'hatorah, ve'amitzvah. 
as it says in the Pasuk in Shemot, God speaking to Moshe, I have given you the Luchot Ha'even, the, the, the stone tablets, the Ten Commandments, HaTorah Ve'amitzvah. I gave you the Torah and I gave you the commandments. So it seems to be some, the surface, first of all, seems a bit redundant, but it's not because it's talking about the entire corpus, which includes elements of Gemara and thought and philosophy and behaviors and so on and so forth. And the mitzvah. But look at how Harambam defines Torah and mitzvah. It's very specific. He says, Torah, zo Torah shebichtav. When in that pasuk, it says Torah, it is referring to Torah shebichtav, the written Torah. The five books of of the Torah, Bereshit, Shemot, Vaikra, Bar, Devarim. That is the Torah Shebechta. Mitzvah, the commandment, Ze Pirusha. That is the interpretation of the written Torah. Now you're going to see that it gets even more particular over here. But clearly already, Harambam has set out for us that there is something called Torah and there is something called Mitzvah, and those are essentially codes or, 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 or symbols for what we would call Torah Shebechtav and Torah Shebaal Peh. The written Torah is Torah, the mitzvah is Torah Shebaal Peh. He and Ikre Torah Shebaal Peh, that's what we call a mitzvah. Now, call a Torah. Do we have any questions up until here? Up until now, we have any questions? Do I see the questions? Everybody, I don't have the full people up here. No, no? I'm scrolling through everyone? I don't think so. Okay. So, He continues, and he says, "Kol haTorah, Kedava Moshe Rabenu Kodem Sheyamut Bichtav Yado." He says, "The entire Torah, what is that? The written Torah. The entire Torah was written by Moshe Rabenu before he died, Bichtav Yado, in his handwriting." Why does he say before he died? Who can tell me? What's important about that? Anyone? Are you able to unmute yourselves, by the way? Yeah. Okay, so one, somebody want to answer my question? Is it because he writes about his own death? No, but a good point. Good point. What about Nevi'im and Ketuvim? What about them? Are they inside the Torah section or not? They, we call them Torah Shebikhtab only because they're written down, but not for these purposes. So where would the Rambam categorize it? He would categorize it as Torah Shebikhtab, but not for these purposes. Because here the Rambam is talking about the mitzvot. And the 613 mitzvot exist only in the fifth, five books of the Torah. He's talking very specifically over here. There are no mitzvot in the Nevi'im and the Ketubim. They are only from Tehillim. Sorry? Don't we learn Alachot from Tehillim or just Alachot? Like... Ah, okay, different. Alachot. And Halachot are taken from Tehillim through the process called Gemara. So we're going to see that. But that's not what Harabam is talking about over here. But you're not answering my question. With respect, you're not answering my question. Those are good questions, and you have every right to ask those questions, and I'm happy to answer them. But I also asked the question, and nobody's answering it for me. The question that I asked was, why does it say Ketava Moshe Rabbeinu? It's enough. It could say Kol HaTorah, Ketava Moshe Rabbeinu, Bechtav Yado. Moshe Rabbeinu wrote the whole Torah by his hand. Why does it say Kodim Sheamut? Is it because there are opinions that say that he didn't write the entire Torah? No. By the way, if I answer that way, does it bother you people? Is it very harsh for you? Because that's this is a chabura. This is not. We're all a family here. It's a chabura. Yeah, so everyone, everyone's. Coming I mean, you're getting the real taste of me a little bit. I'm not being so it's nice so and British. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of zerok marab talmidim. It's okay. No, why? One more chance. Why does it say ktava Moshe Rabbeinu kodim shiamut b'chetav yado? Maybe it has to be by a living human. No. Is it because it only ever talks about in the Torah that he, he wrote down the Aserat Hadibra? It never talks about him writing down anything else. So, you know, it must have been at the end of his life that he wrote down everything that we now have. That's Itty? Who's talking? Yeah, Itty. I know your voice. How cool. I don't even see you. That's great. 
that is pretty okay good. so i want you to elaborate because i think that you're saying what you should be saying but i'm not sure if you're saying what you should be saying because you've you've kind of distracted me with the ten commandments so um I mean, uh, the way I, I mean, I, I might be wrong, but no, no, the way I see it, he, um, it never says in the Torah that he kind of writes down anything. So it must be that he kind of writes it down at the end of his life. The only time we, it talks about him writing down anything is in terms of the Aserat Hadibra that he writes it on the, you know, yeah, the, uh, the stones and stuff like that. But it never talks about him actually writing down uh, the entire Torah so that must have occurred right before he died. Yes. Thank you. Essentially, yes. Now, it could be that, her, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu wrote portions of the Torah as it went along, because it's clear that at least according to Arambam, and it is the most rational thing to say, that certainly Moshe Rabbeinu did not write Parashat Pinchas, for example, at Har Sinai. This was something that was given over to Moshe Rabbeinu over the course of his 40, last 40 years of his life. And what Moshe does is he writes down the written part before he dies, because he didn't write all of it at the beginning. It was written, it was given, there was a process, there was time at the point of his death, he writes it down. What does he write down? The Torah. So Harambam is very much focusing over here on particular terms that he has just defined and explaining to us how these came about and manifested. V'natan sefer lechol shevet v'shevet. V'sefer had netanahu ba'aron na'ed. So he wrote, essentially, according to Arambam, 13 Sfarim. Yeah, and this is not Arambam, he's not pulling this out of his imagination. This is discussed by the Hachamim, but he's, he's posek here. He's establishing here, this is what Torah and Torah, Torah and Mitzvah are, or Torah Shebikhtav and Torah Shebaal Peh are. And so he's saying, what we have as Torah Shebikhtav is what Moshe Rabbin wrote with his own hand before he died 13 times one for each Shevet, and one to be placed in the Aaron, Le'ed. What does Le'ed mean? The witness. Witnessing what? Testimony. What is, the, I, know, I know, I know, I know the, the meaning of the word. I'm saying, what, what is it, what is it testifying to? That he wrote it before he died. No. Anyone else? Can be used to copy to make new uh, Sifre Torah? Close. Yeah, close. Not just to copy to make new Sifre Torah, but to be able to reference, to know what the Torah says. It was the source text. That's what it means, Larry. And he says, he put it in the Aaron, which this is a side point. There's a, there's a machloket in, in Baba Batra between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda, where this Sefer was placed. Rabbi Meir says it was placed inside the Aaron. Rabbi Yehuda says daf. There was a daf that was built on the outside of the Aaron, and the sefer was placed on that daf on the outside. Clearly, Harambam is posek like Rabbi Meir. He says that Netanel ba'aron na'ed. Shene'emar lakowah et sefer atorah zeh v'samtem oto mitzad Aaron berit Adonai lo'echem. Even though the pasuk says mitzad on the side. Harambam is saying it was ba'aron. Berit Adonai lo'echem v'ayasham becha Le'ed, and there it should be amongst you as a witness to what's written. Okay, so for all the questions of the Nevi'im, the Ketubim, and so on and so forth, yes, in broad terms, we call that Torah Shebikhtav, because clearly it's not Baalpeh, nor was it meant to be Baalpeh, and it, it is part of the broad sense of Torah. Here we are not talking about the broad sense of Torah. It's very important for us to understand that because we're not used to thinking that way. It's the reason why Harambam is defining these terms very specifically. And he's saying, when I say Torah here in this Hakdama, for these purposes, I am referring to the written Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu that includes everything that he wrote before he died, which clearly does not include the book of Shmuel and the book of Tehillim. So that's the first part. And that was written down 13 times. The 13th book, or whatever you want to call it, was put in the Aaron's testimony. Ve ha mitzvah. 
המצווה שהיא פירוש התורה לא כתבה. The פירוש of the Torah, the interpretation of the written components of the Torah, which was not written down, אלא ציווה בה, he commanded that written, that uh, oral aspect of the Torah, לזקנים וליהושע ולשאר כל ישראל. He gave it over orally to them. Gave it over to the Zekinim, to the elders, to the, to the leaders, to Yehoshua, his prime student, who was going to take things over from him, which is going to become very important in a little bit. Ushar kol Yisrael taught to the rest of Israel. And as far as Arambam is concerned, and he does this in much more explicit ways in the opening to the Mishnah that he writes of his commentary on the Mishnah, that Moshe Rabbeinu at least once taught the, the, the interpretation orally of his written Torah to the entirety of Israel. Shneemar, et kol adavar asher ani anochi mitzavetchem, oto tishmeru laasot. Everything that I command you, you must keep to do. So it's not just that you keep the words that are written, you have to act them, you have to do them. Uvibnezeh, that is why this component of the Torah is called Baal Peh because it was taught orally. It was not written down. That's a very strange language also. Why does Arambam say, Av al pi shelo nikhteva Torah she Baal Peh? It's a big deal. He's saying that because until now, all we've been talking about is the written Torah. That's what Moshe did. And so what he's saying over here is even though we've been talking about the written component and the written component is what Moshe wrote down and he wrote 13 of them and one of them was an Aed, there was this other component that is just as important and comes together with the written Torah. It doesn't need to be written down. It's not meant to be written down. That was also given over by Moshe Rabbeinu, equally like the written Torah. It was taught by Moshe to his Bedin of 70 elders, as well as Elazar, Pinhas, Yehoshua, Shiloshtam Kibilum Moshe. The three of them received this from Moshe. So this is really important. Before we go on, before we go on, I want to pause. Because now Harambam is going to now start taking us through the transmission of what it is that Moshe has given over over here. And it's really important for us to be able to understand that what I was saying to you at the beginning about the difference between Torah Shabbat and Gemara is not a light difference. It is a huge thing. Excuse me. Because what, what, what Harambam is saying over here is that what essentially was given over by Moshe Rabbeinu was not Gemara. And it's very interesting because look at what he says. I want to go back over here and take a look at what it is that he says. Where are we? Look at this. We're going to go back up here. Okay. He says, based on now understanding what we've understood, there's a very strange line that we kind of just read right past. We didn't pay much attention to. Let's look at this again. Okay, I'm going to bring you up here again. He says, Torah is the Torah Shebikhtav. The mitzvah perusha is the interpretation of the Torah Shebikhtav. Now I'm going to ask you, where did that interpretation come from? Anyone? It's not a rhetorical question. I'm asking you, where did that perush come from? the 40 days that he went up? No, I'm not asking when he got it. I'm asking what is the source of that perush? Torah Sorry? Torah Shabbat Yes, the Torah Shabbat Peh. What is the source of the perush? God himself? What? God directly to, Mo to Moshe? Yes, God. So look what Hanabam writes over here. He says, V'tzivanu la'asot Torah al pi mitzvah he told us to do the written Torah based on the mitzvah, which is the perush of the Torah. Well, what else would we do it with? 
That's of course how we're going to do it. What other pirush would we use? You follow my question? You think it's a bad question? You can't. You're allowed. That's also part of the nice perks of the Chabura. You can just tell me it's a bad question. Uh, do you understand my question? Would we just understand things like I, like I for I, as literal meaning without the actual? Pedagogy? I wish I could see everybody because I can't because I'm sharing the screen. Hold on, let me let me open this up here. Maybe I can do this. Oh, okay, okay. I see you all. I see you all now. Okay, who's talking? I actually don't have my camera on. Oh, lovely! How nice that you don't have your camera on. <laughs> Are you having a bad hair day? Yeah. Okay. We now we'll, we'll, we'll pardon you this time, but you know, if you were in a real Chabura, you wouldn't be able to turn your camera off. I would still see you, unless you have some other magical kind of qualities that I don't know about. And if you do, let's talk after <laughs> class. We'll take it. We'll take it into account. Yeah, yeah. Um, what were you saying? Maybe, maybe we can misinterpret very easily what's written in the Torah if we leave it to just our, our own interpretations. I, I, listen to my question again, what I'm asking. I'm asking a very simple question. Whose pirush would we use if not God's? What, 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 kind of, what kind of a line is this? I don't understand. If you tell me that the Torah is the written Torah, and the mitzvah pirusha, the mitzvah is pirusha, tzivan ulaso Torah al pi mitzvah ta, al pi the mitzvah. Well, of course, what else would I do it on? What else would I use? Why would you need any? Maybe you don't need No, any. it's not my, don't ask you, don't, you don't get to ask a question. I ask a question. You can ask a question later. I can answer that <laughs> question later, but I'm asking a question. Don't deflect my question with your question. I'm asking a question. It's a very, very reasonable question. Were, were there people at the time who were, who were interpreting it in their own way? So he's What trying if? To there was no if, they just got it. No, 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 I mean, he's right. To, uh, is your question, why is he saying this? Yes. I'm saying, why is Haram Bam saying this? It's obvious. What other perush would I use? What other perush would I be commanded to follow the Torah with than the perush that was given over by God at Har Sinai, by Moshe? Perhaps you would, you would assume that he was expecting us to use our rationale or something like that, like the, the way he explains and defines Gemara. Perhaps he now, would it makes no sense, Iti, respectfully, because this was a perush that was given. Well, right. It's not like he said, oh, go, by the way, there's a perush here that you guys might want to use from God. To, to what Sina said, though, um, the Karaites were obviously one of the biggest philosophical opponents to rabbinic Judaism at the time, and they didn't hold by the perush. They didn't hold by the, the oral law. And so by... That's not relevant to the Rambam. But it's relevant to the people who he's writing the Hakdama for. It, because they've been living with Karaites. Wonderful. Yeah. Even according to what you're saying, Joseph Cohen, I don't need to write that line because I have already established, as the Rambam has done, right? The Rambam has already established that there's a perush which goes against the Karaites. Well, obviously, if there's a perush from God, which already suggests that God is suggesting that this is the way that you should interpret what it is that I've written. Okay. Maybe because it was voluntary? Maybe they saw it as like, I don't know, a voluntary thing to look at. Maybe it's not necessary. Why would it be voluntary? I don't understand. How could it be voluntary? Because it's not written. There clearly must be a difference between what's written and what's not. Yeah, okay, but maybe so people... What you're saying, like, wait, wait. So let's understand what you're saying. What you're saying is that God gave a written law and said, oh, and by the way, um, my opinion as to how to inter inter interpret this is this. What say you? That's not what was going on over here. If that's how it was presented, then perhaps, but it's not what's going on. It was, it was the official interpretation. That's exactly what he's saying over here. Okay, so what I want to explain is very simple, and it's important for us to pay very close attention to this, because again, it is counterintuitive to what we traditionally learn in the general Jewish world and in yeshiva and so on and so forth. Harambam says over here, uh, where am I? Ugh, this thing keeps jumping. Yes, here. Okay. Tzivanu la'asot ha-Torah al pi ha-mitzvah. He commanded us to do the Torah based on the mitzvah specifically. 
And what is the mitzvah specifically? The Torah Shabbat Peh. And I told you that the Torah Shabbat Peh is very specific. There are ma many aspects of the oral Torah that are not necessarily included in Torah Shabbat Peh. What he commanded us was to do the Torah al piya mitzvah. And what is the doing of the Torah? The doing of the Torah is actual carrying out of the mitzvah. Actual performance of the mitzvah must be based on Torah Shebaal Peh specifically, not any other component of the oral elements. Not on the hashkafic elements, not on the, uh, you know, what they call in yeshiva, the lomdish elements, not the masa matan, the arguments back and forth, not, not the drashot, not any of that. In all of that comes something that we call Torah Shebaal Peh, which is the Rambam's book. Which interestingly, all the stuff that I just mentioned really isn't in the Rambam's book. And yet he says very boldly, you can learn the whole Torah Shabbat Peh from my book. And that's why he says, we were commanded to do the Torah, to act the Torah based on specifically that component of the oral, of the oral elements of interpretation. Do you follow what I'm saying? Do you hear this? Very important. Extremely important. What's our time? Okay, good. Questions? Everybody clear? So very action oriented. This is. Yeah, yeah, that. Not the entirety, this. No, is. no, no, this, his focus. Right, yeah. and that, and Harambam absolutely writes that explicitly. He says the problem with the Gemara is that there's no way, there's, it's, it's very difficult to know what to do. He writes this to a student. He says, I, it's so hard to go through the Talmud and find the Torah Shabal Peh from the Talmud of the what conclusion. I need to do. And so well, you know what I did here? He tells the student, he goes, you have no idea what I did here. Nobody really understands what I did here. I actually extracted the whole of the Torah Shabal Peh from the ocean of the Talmud, which comprises so much more than just Torah Shabbat. Okay? It's called Gemara for a reason. And that's what he does over here. Is that setting in with everyone? Okay. It's huge. It's massive. It's massive. All right. So now once Harambam establishes that, he then talks about, well, this is a very precious thing, isn't it? Because we've got a written component and we've got an oral component that interprets the written component in terms of la sota, right? In terms of actually doing it, what needs to be done? Well, it's the most precious thing. How do I make, I have to protect that. And I have to faithfully transmit it. So what Harambam attempts to do over here is saying, now I'm going to explain to you how this specifically was transmitted. See, people have this idea that everything that you read in the Gemara was transmitted from Moshe to Yeshua to everybody. Uh, that's, that's not the case. You know, the, the, the conversations between Ravina and Ravashi and the conversations between Abai and Rava, the Havayot of Abaye Rava, as he refers to them, were all given over by Moshe Rabbeinu down to Sinai and carried by every single one. That's not true. What was given over was the Torah and the Mitzvah. It's not to say, I want to be clear, it's not to say that there were not other components at Moshe's time that were spoken of, studied, learned, written personally, and so, but they did not comprise this precious uh, cargo of, of, of knowledge, of, of commandment and interpretation that had to be passed from one generation to the next. That was essential, which is why, by the way, when Torah Shabbat Peh is finally written down, what does it focus on? What does it focus on? Law of action and deed. The Rambam saw himself as a second Rabbi Yudha Nasi. The Rambam saw himself as I'm going to categorize, Rabbi Yudha Nasi categorized it one way, 
I'm going to categorize it a different way. And I'm going to include in it the elements that came out of Torah Shabbat Peh and that are connected back to Torah Shabbat Peh that occurred between that time. So you may ask, well, I mean, what, well, what is that? Is there, is there stuff that comes out of Torah Shabbat Peh that's still Torah Shabbat Peh? Yes. It gets a little bit complicated, as we're going to see as we go on. Okay, so this is very important to be able to orient ourselves into what we're talking about over here. Because it's easy to just say the whole Torah, you know, everything Hacham Abadiah wrote was given by Moshe to Yehoshua. You know, no, no. Okay, so he continues and he says, listen very carefully, what he says over here is, He taught all of it, the whole of the oral Torah, which is what the interpretation of the written Torah in terms of La Sota was given to the Betin of Zikinim. It was also given to Lazar, to Binhas, and to Yoshua, all three of them, Kibilum Moshe. All three of them, right? Pinhas, Yoshua, Elazar, received this cargo of Torah, the Torah and the mitzvah, the Torah Shebechtav and the Torah Shebaal Peh, directly from Moshe. And they all received it intact, right? It was wholly given, intact. And what happened is, I see the raised hands, the Yoshua Shu Talmido Shel Moshe Rabbeinu, Masar Torah Shebaal Peh, V'tzivahu Aleha. But there was one of those that had special task. One of them had the task not only of receiving it, but of transmitting it. And that was tasked, Yoshua was tasked with doing that. So Yoshua not only had to receive it in toto, he had to transmit it in toto. As it says over here, Yoshua, she would tell me, Doshan Moshe Rabbeinu, Yoshua was the actual student of Moshe Rabbeinu, direct student of Moshe Rabbeinu, Masar Torah Shebaal Peh. He gave over the Torah Shebaal Peh. Notice the difference between Masar and what's the other language used for everybody up here? What's the word that's used? Hello? Kibe. No. Limda. Limeda. He taught it to them, but he didn't entrust it with them. Yoshua Masar Torah Shabbat Peh. And now only Masar, Tzivahu Aleha. He commanded Yoshua to carry it on. Uh, Rabbi, Sorry? Rabbi, what was the, what was the point in, in teaching Come on, it? I didn't see you here. I'm here. What a, what a um, nice surprise. Um, what's the point of teaching it to Elazar and Pinchas? And the not everybody else, or other people, if they're, not, if they're not passing it on? Very good question. The reason that he taught it to them was because we also needed people to actually know this in order to be able to know what to do. So like you and I will study this, we'll learn the Mishneh Torah, even though I and you may not be entrusted as what we would call ma'atikeh shmoa, right? That's the term that's ending, ended up using for it. That's because I need to know it too. So the way that they did it was they had these, these you know, these, uh, uh, what you call it? Um, you know, not portals, um, terminals, right? You know? Mm-hmm. So they were made into terminals to be able to carry it over, carry it over, carry it over. But Yoshua was entrusted with giving it over to the next generation. Does that make sense? Um, no. No, I, I mean, what, they were just there to hold the information? They, no, they, they were there to be able to, amp- a, they were there to amplify it. Uh-huh. In other words, because Moshe could not really teach it to the entire people, although he did once, Right? The way that you learn oral, oral elements is repetition, which is why, again, Rabbi Yudan he calls it the Mishnah, is repetition. So he needed people that had it to be able to teach it and repeat it and put it out into the people then, there, at that time. All right, okay, fine. Right. You follow? But the, yeah, but the, but yeah, the okay. football, so to speak, of Torah Shebechtav and Torah Shebaal Peh needed to be transmitted from generation to generation. You needed right. one guy that was holding sure. the, football, yeah. the Torah football. And that was Yoshua in this case. Nice. And that's okay. why it says, Masar Torah, Shabbat Peh, Betzivahu Aleha. Doesn't say that about the others. The other just says he taught them and they taught. 
וכן יהושע הכל אומר חייב לימד על פה, right? So too, יהושע all the days of his life, he didn't, he, he didn't, own, this is why it's very important, because he says יהושע, even though he was entrusted with holding the Torah football, he also taught. Not just the Mesira, he didn't just do the Mesira, he also taught. You follow this? And that's what, what is, it, that's what, what is, it, sorry. Who's that, who's talking? Sorry, Yeshua, I wanted to ask, what is the practical, practical difference of him having the football, like in the, like in the playing field? What, what exactly would it be different from what Yeshua did to what Pinchas and uh, Elazar did? The practical did? difference is that Elazar and Pinchas had no responsibility to give this over to the next generation to make sure that it carried on intact. Their only responsibility was to give Shiva. Is it that a competition? They have no goal? responsibility of transmission. They have responsibility of education, not transmission. That's the difference. I'm having trouble. I'm, I'm not having trouble understanding the difference between transmission and. Uh... Okay, so 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 l- l- let me try and, and present it to you in, in, in relatively simple terms. Okay, let's say that. I have a story, you know, once upon a time, uh, A, B, C, D, F, G, right? Yeah. And I need that that story should be given over to the next generation, to my children, and that my children should carry that story over to the following generation, exactly intact. As I said it to them, they should say it to their children, so on and so forth, so on and so forth, right? At the same time, I want everybody in my family to know the story. So I have one kid who I teach the story to. I say, now listen here, Buster, you must keep the story and make sure that you give this over in the way that I'm giving it over to you. You are responsible for making sure the story gets to the next generation in the way that I gave it to you and that you tell the next generation, they should give it to the next generation that way. In the meantime, let's sit the family down and talk to them about the story and tell them the story. Nobody in the family is responsible of what I just told Buster to do. Do you follow? It's a Bechor figure, right? No. no. Similar. Why you, why, no. No, I'm saying because, as, I don't know, like, I feel like the Torah, how it portrays the Bechor and uh, also. But why are you going there? I'm talking, I'm telling you. No, because of the way, because of the way how the Bechor is meant to transmit the values, like is the closer connection. Okay, to if, that's what, how you, if that's how you want to understand it, but it doesn't have to be a Bechor. It just has to be somebody. Okay, yeah, 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 no, yeah, yeah. Right, it just has to be somebody who's capable of doing this faithfully. You understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you yeah, understand yeah. the difference now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I will. Thank you. Very good. Excellent. So, so Rob, there was, there yeah. could have already been an alternative. Wait, okay, so hold on, hold on, hold on. I've got four people with hands raised. So let's start. Joseph, come. So mine's going to go back a bit, um, but it's just I wanted to make sure I was clear on what you were were saying with the um, interpretation and I guess the transmission as well. And that is that you're saying that if we were to take any commandment, um, if we were to take not to cut yourself, the interpretations of that mitzvah they go all the way back to Moshe and all the way back to God. Is that what you were saying? And then I just wondered- it's What I was saying, essentially, they will not be only relegated to that because there is room even in Torah Shabal Peh to develop. But yes, essentially that's what I was saying. Okay, cool. okay. that was my question. Uh, Ohad. So what, what is the state of Kibela? Kibbelu, which is the middle one. They received the teaching from Moshe. How is that different than the Lamod? He just asked that. Oh, yeah? Were you not listening? He just asked it. It's, the reception just means that they sat in Moshe's classroom and received the teaching from him. They are not entrusted with holding it intact, giving it over to the next generation, carrying the football. They're not entrusted with it. They're entrusted with teaching. No, but what, that's the that, Disseminating. What is it? That's the last one. That's Masal Torah. No. Which is the last one? Meaning there's, there's Limeda, there's Kibilu, and there's Masal. There's Al Pinchas and Yeshua. No. And the other- when Limeda, the opposite action of Limeda is Kibilu. Kibilu Mashi Limed. So why is it only Pinchas and Yeshua? Why? Only them, only them three Kibilu Mimosheh. 
as opposed to the also the shivim zekanim. No, okay, so the shivim zekanim. He's saying that he taught them; they were amongst them. But he's saying that they were these these three were designated as chief teachers. So the zekanim. What are the zekanim? The zekanim are from the shivatim. Zekanim were also responsible for being able to give it over. But what it's saying is that Moshe taught the Zekanim personally. They didn't get the Torah from Yoshua and Elazar and Pinhas and so on and so forth. The Zekanim of Moshe's time, his Bedin, he taught it to them directly. And then he taught it to Elazar and Pinhas and Yoshua, and they were entrusted with teaching it to the people and disseminating it. Yoshua had an added element. Yeah? Ezra. Um, if the Torah Shavu was received directly from God, then where is the room for the development that you referred to earlier? Right, that I referenced to Joseph, to, 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 to Yosef, right? So we're going to see that later on. But essentially, anything that comes from a branch of Torah Shavu that is a development of the Torah Shavu is Torah Shavu There are branches that are not Torah Shavu But anything that comes from the root of Torah Shavu and branches from Torah Shabbat Peh is Torah Shabbat Peh. And those things can be established without getting ahead of ourselves by the Sanhedrin. Right? So we're going to see that later on, but we haven't gotten there yet. But very good question. Just to follow up, another yes. similar question is when you have Torah Shabbat Peh that comes directly from God, where's the room for Machloket in that? It could, it's no just room. one side There's is no wrong. There's no room for Machloket. There's no room for Machloket. That, there was never supposed to be Machloket. Machloket's a problem. Okay, and then next to Ezra, but I don't know if you actually see yourself next to Ezra with your head. The only one with the hand raised, I don't see a name. I'm sorry. Uh, Adam, Adam, okay. Uh, hello, Rabbi. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, is there a chance that um, in Moshe giving, the, giving over in all these different ways, obviously he selected Yehoshua as his designated um, yes. student to take the Torah forward, but is there a chance that, he, that some different halachic jurisprudence may have developed by giving it to the Shivim Zekenim, who were obviously um, holding Bate Din at the time, and then you had al Azar and Pinchas, who also kind of doing things their own way, but they weren't the designated successor. So how was that all drawn back together in what Yehoshua then transmitted on to the next generation? Adam Krantz, that is an excellent question. Excellent question. What Adam is asking, I hope everybody hears what he asked, right? If I have a Bedin that was given, that has this Torah by Moshe, which would theoretically seem that it should be establishing some judicial establishment of law, as what a Bedin is essentially meant to do, right? Well, doesn't that end up creating nuance in the actual corpus of Torah Shabbat Peh? I mean, is that what you're asking, essentially? Yeah, essentially. Okay, right. I mean, it's a very, very serious and important question. So two answers to that question. One answer that has to do directly with Moshe Rabbeinu's time, right? So in Moshe Rabbeinu's time, it was an artificial Bet Din in the sense that we know it today, right? Or that we would understand the Sanhedrin. Because the way that the Bet Din, as we see in Parashat of the Shavuah, Parashat, you know, Parashat bin Has, the mm -hmm. cases are brought to Moshe and he says, hold on, let me ask God, right? So, so the, it actually becomes the Raja Bichtav in Moshe Rabbeinu's time. So he's talking just before he dies, right? There's another thing. So these, what your question is, is asking essentially in the time of Yoshua, right? And yes, it's a valuable question. So how does the jurisprudence of the Betin affect the individual entrusted in the matik, in the, in the requirement of trans, transmitting things? So there are two things. One, like I said to, to my son Ezra, there are nonetheless elements that will be branches from Torah Shabbat Peh that become part of Torah Shabbat Peh that now must be included in the transmission. That's one. Two, it is possible that there will be local establishments made that are local and particular addressals to local situations that do not nonetheless become the body of Torah Shabbat Peh. Do you follow that? Yeah. Thank Hold you. on, I just have to answer this one thing because I do have a thing. So sorry.
Yeah. Okay. Are we good? Are we good? Because it is time to end. Yeah. I think Rachel's got a question in the chat. Where? Oh, hold on. I don't see the chat. One second. Uh, I, why don't I see the chat? Oh, again, it's because of the screen share. Okay, I'm going to stop screen share. Okay, here we go. Um, oh, okay, Rachel. If there's no room for Mahal, okay. What about 70 faces of Torah? That has nothing to do with what we're talking about, the 70 faces of Torah. That has to do with the broader elements of, of the oral Torah, not the oral law. That has to do with the with the inyan. Yeah. Thank you. So that can be drawn later on, you know, in the arguments of the hachamim, and you know how it is that they actually argue in terms of law and hilel and shamai and all those kinds of things. But that's not that's not how it runs in terms of the actual football, right? I guess I'm going to have to use that analogy. Yeah, that doesn't manifest it. It could be that one of the seventy approaches ends up manifesting right and getting in there, and that that becomes part of it. But it's not it's not the 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 actual nature of Torah Shabbat Pei itself. Okay, Daniel, last question for tonight. How how is there room for development if there's no verification uh, after Moshe passes and there's now room for development without Moshe or anyone that could actually go back to God to verify whether the development is correct or not? You mean like broken telephone? I mean, if it's developed, then you're developing on something that's already there. So if Moshe got the Harash Baal Peh, that's what he got. And if there's room for development, we're developing off of what there is. Does that development need I'm not, to be verified? Slow down. I'm not, I'm not following you. When you say development, what do you mean? Um, well, so then I guess I'll go back a step. Is, is what Moshe received almost closed? Like there is no growth on top of that? No, I didn't, of that. Baal Peh. I didn't say so that. I didn't say that. So then my question is, is the growth that's built on top of what he received? Not on top. It's an organic development of what it is that he received, but it's extremely specific and, and, and it's strict in terms of what actually is the developments of this thing and what's allowed in terms of recognized developments of this thing. So, yeah. So there doesn't, need to, be a, there doesn't need to be a verification of that development that accurate. that's part of the that's part of the stricture of of rules of how these things develop it's part of the whole system the system is set up for that kind of verification and stricture which we'll see i just don't want to get ahead of ourselves right we need patience also that's one of the 48 things that a person needs to learn okay i'd kind everyone i thank you very very much for your presence and for your time i hope that this is working well i will say that if anybody feels that things could be tweaked or if the structure can be tweaked and so on and so forth then speak to sinna <laughs> he'll, he'll he'll revert it to me and we'll try to make it so that everybody you know kind of feels the best way i mean we can't be all things to all people but we will do our best to kind of make sure that the habura feels as though it is a habura and, and people are getting what they need out of it. I'm really happy to see many of you. I didn't realize some of you were here, so it's an honor to, to share with you. I will say this though, in this setting, uh, no pressure, but being that when you walk in public, your face is with you, whether you like it or not, unless you're wearing a burqa, we're going to, I'm going to request that when you're present in this chabura, you show yourself, because uh, I wanna be able to see. Um, so do your hair and makeup before, before. All right, everyone. Rob. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. You, Every, thank you, Rav. Uh, fantastic. Very, very helpful. I mean, again, fundamentals. Looking forward to part two. Everybody, when is part please two? Make, when is part part two? two is, let me tell you now. So next it week is, is Diane Livnat, right? Next day is Diane Livnat. The week after is Learn from a Habura member. The week after right. is History. So I think it's the 5th of August. Okay. The next uh, Halakha class. Lovely. So everybody review. Review until yes. then. Okay, yes, you have a Thank you. Okay, cool. Yeah.